six words. Six words was all it took to make my blood run cold. To make my legs turn to jelly. To reduce me to a quivering, snivelling wreck. Because when I heard these six words, as a child, I hasten to add, I knew that the game was up. You want to know what those six words are, don't you? Wait till your father gets home. Because when I heard those words, I knew I was going to get a stern talking to. That I had done something so bad that even my mother didn't want to deal with me. That she was going to go straight to the top of the discipline tree. And I knew that that meant I was going to get some tough discipline. And it scared me witless. Now, just to clarify here, my dad is a wonderful man and I love him dearly. And even though he could be a disciplinarian when he had to be, he is also a loving, caring man and I am grateful to have him as my earthly father. And I'm not at all traumatized by his discipline growing up. Because let's face it, I, I knew that I did some very stupid things as a child and I probably deserved every telling off I got. But I tell you that story because I feel like that just a little bit when I read these verses that we're going to be looking at today. Because we're carrying on in our sermon series, unpacking the book of 1 Corinthians together. And today we're going to be looking at the back part of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the beginning part of which Amanda so helpfully laid out for us last week. We saw then Paul's almost over-the-top sarcasm intended to make the church in Corinth stop and think about their behaviour and dismiss the petty factions that seem to have risen up among them. He tells them that they have everything in Christ Jesus because of the work of Paul himself and as well as the, the work of the other apostles who first preached to them and who laid the early groundwork for the church in Corinth. He scoffs at them, we read last week when he contrasts how good he thinks that they have it, whilst he and the other apostles are suffering so badly for the sake of the gospel. You remember last week, Paul likened it almost to like being at the, the, the condemned slaves at the end of a military procession, being led to slaughter like the spoils of war, whilst the church in Corinth were enjoying themselves and enjoying all the good gifts that God had blessed them with. It's quite the telling off he gives them, isn't it? And yet, in these verses that we're going to look at today, in the latter, latter part of this chapter, there's a marked shift in Paul's tone. You get a strong sense of how much he loves the church in Corinth and how much he longs to see them sort their issues out and get right with God again. He becomes, well, a bit like a caring dad, really, wanting the best for his children. So let's read through today's verses together. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 14 and going through to the end of the chapter, verse 21. Let's read them together now. Paul says, I am not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, to imitate me. For this reason, I'm sending you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing. And then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a whip or in love and with a gentle spirit? What can we see here? We can see here Paul becoming a lot more conciliatory and loving towards the Corinthian church. It's a bit like the carrot to the stick of the previous verses that we looked at, but still with a strong sense of warning at the end. The language he uses towards them is very much like that of a parent, isn't it? 
right at the beginning, to, uh, he says to them something along the lines of, I'm not mad at you. I'm just disappointed. Which is the kind of thing you can imagine your parents telling you, can't you? I can almost imagine the first time this letter was read out in the church in Corinth. People suddenly looking a little bit sheepish, looking a little bit uncomfortable with themselves, maybe shuffling their feet nervously. You see, in something of an echo of chapter 3, which we looked at a little while ago, he addresses them, he, when he addressed them then, as mere infants in Christ. Here, Paul carries that metaphor on and explicitly calls them dear children. And he calls himself their father through the gospel. Well, what, what does Paul mean by that? What he means is, is that by being the one to first preach the gospel to them and lead them to salvation in Christ Jesus, he is something like a spiritual father to this church. And what I love uh, about the, these beginning verses is that when Paul says, even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, it sounds like he's drifting into hyperbole again. But the Greek word he uses for guardians there is pedagogai. The word pedagogas uh, means a tutor for a young boy. Someone who would instruct children in things like basic schooling, reading and writing and so on, in the ways of the law and in general conduct. Young children in Greek households would not have been able to leave their house without their pedagogus right by their side. You see, Paul's really laying it on thick here, isn't he? But what he's telling them is that you have enough teachers. You have enough people telling you what to do. I don't want to have to be another one and come to you as a stern disciplinarian. I want you to know me as a father figure. And in doing so, what I think Paul is doing is giving the Corinthians and even us today a model for what servant leadership should look like in the church. And what it looks like is the church, the body of Christ, fathering one another. Now, although Paul is explicitly addressing factions within the church and with church members aligning themselves to one leader or one apostle or another, I think it's important to say here that I don't think he's just talking about the apostles or even just elders in a local church. I think what he's talking about here is genuine, servant-hearted discipling. You can call it leadership in the church, perhaps. You can call it one anothering. But, but it, it happens between church members themselves. Now, don't mishear me, because yes, good church governance in, implies a structure of clear leadership. And yes, elders and deacons and apostles are all good and all very necessary for a healthy and functioning church. But I think what Paul is describing here is a mature church, which he knows the Corinthians are not at yet. But a mature church is one that is not personality or leadership driven, but one where people lead and are led by one another within the church as they seek to pursue God in humility and in community together. And so if we want to apply this to our context, the question we need to ask ourselves is, who am I allowing myself to be influenced by? And who am I pouring out my life to, to be a positive influence in my immediate community? Because we live in the age of the influencer, don't we? And I don't mean that in a negative way at all. The way our communication structures work now mean that anyone can build a platform deliver a message and gain followers. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because actually what it's done is democratized communication for us all. And it's given a voice to many people in many different places who might not otherwise have had one. Now that obviously requires some wisdom, doesn't it? To ensure that we are receiving good influence and not bad. And it also comes with a big challenge. And that challenge, of course, is that influencers can have exactly that influence over our lives. But because of the lack of proximity to us, they don't always have exactly the same right to speak directly into our lives. To give you just one example, you can get the best of Christian teaching, mostly for free, anytime you like. Today, you have access to more godly Christian literature than perhaps at any other moment in human history. And it's great, isn't it? It's wonderful. I would encourage you to get into as much of it as you can. It's good for your personal development. It's good for your own learning. 
And it can be good for your walk with God as well. See, even now, with the blessing of being part of Everyday Online, you are able to listen to me deliver this message wherever you are in the world. And that's amazing. And it's God's, God's gift to us all. And yet, at the same time, it humbles me greatly. Because Paul is making the point here that discipling is done by one anothering. Imitate me, he says. He's saying that you need spiritual fathers in your life. Because, as Andrew Wilson himself says, disciples are ultimately made by people, not primarily by ideas. And so Christian teaching is great, yes. But one of the questions we need to ask ourselves is, where is my local church discipleship happening? And again, I realise this presents us with a particular challenge, if you're watching this online. Because there are lots of reasons, good reasons, why we are unable to meet in person. It might be due to physical distance from a local church. It might be due to inability for one reason or another to actually get into a church. Or perhaps there's even a danger of you gathering together publicly with other believers. But the truth is, even as you're watching this message now, you may never meet me in person. In fact, you might watch this message and you may never hear from me again. And so, while I get the opportunity now to speak into your life, you can't see my life. You don't know what I'm like when the cameras are off. And I don't know what's going on in your life either. Which is why some form of intimate, local, personal discipleship with one another is so important for all of us, whether it is online or in person. You need to be embedded in a church where you know this is my gathering. You need a small group of trusted advisors around you who know your life, who know your struggles, and who can speak into your particular situation with the wisdom of God. You need leaders around you. You need spiritual fathers of one kind or another. And that can take time and effort, can't it? It takes effort to get stuck into a local gathering. It takes humility to submit to leaders of a church, even if wherever you're gathered doesn't tick all of your personal boxes. And it takes time to find a small group of people that you can trust, that you can be honest and vulnerable with, and that you will allow yourself to be shaped and moulded and influenced by. But it's worth it. Because as Proverbs 27.17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. This is a two-way street we're talking about here. Which means that not only are we influenced by the people around us, but the level of trust we build up together means that we can start to influence them as well. Now, you might feel ill-equipped to do that. You might be thinking, how exactly do I practically speak into someone's life? I don't know if I could do that. Well, I, I find Paul's instruction to another church, the church of Thessalonica, quite helpful here. Let's read 1 Thessalo Thessalonians 5 uh, verse 14 together. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Let's look at this backwards, because actually I find that a little bit more helpful. Firstly, be patient with everyone. You are going to meet people in your church or in your life group that are going to rub you up the wrong way. It's just going to happen, I'm afraid. But when we remember that we are all made in the image of God, and if we remember what Paul said at the beginning of the letter to the Corinthians, that none of us can boast because none of us are better than anyone else, we are all on equal standing with Christ, then we can learn to have grace with one another. In every church, you're going to encounter people around you who simply struggle with life more than you do. Whether it's because of illness, finances, a chaotic home life, whatever it might be. God has put them around you so that you can help and be a blessing to them. So when you serve on a Sunday, you are serving the whole body. When you give a lift to life group, to that friend who couldn't get there perhaps any other way, you're helping the weak. And when you assist someone in a way in which you're good at and perhaps they're not as good at, then you're living out this one anothering in the body in the best possible way and in which we are all called to. Encourage the disheartened. Well, we're all called to share one another's burdens together, aren't we? And everyone needs someone around them 
to help lift their heads and to see Jesus working in their particular situation, even when perhaps at that moment in time they can't. You remember, as we looked at in our Eagerly Desire series, Paul will later tell the Corinthians that if one part of the body suffers, then every part of it suffers as well. So encourage the disheartened. Be a blessing to people. Help them see what God is doing in their lives. And finally, if we can do all of that, then we earn the right to speak into each other's lives. The lives of, of, of those who Paul calls are perhaps idle or disruptive. We can warn people then once we've had enough credibility, once we've you know, been there for them when they need it the most. We have the credibility to speak into people's lives and tell them, you know what, your behavior is not good and you're going down a dangerous road. I want to help you and I want to bring you back into fellowship with Christ. We can warn people in the same way that Paul doesn't shy away from a blunt challenge when it's needed, but only once he's built up enough credibility to do so. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. See, Paul sums up all of this with the instruction to imitate me. And again, because of what we've just been speaking about, you might be asking yourself the question, well, but how can Paul expect them to imitate him? He's not actually even there. He's writing them a letter. He's not physically present with them. How does he expect them to imitate him? Well, the good news is, is that Paul has a plan. Because he, he knows that he is a spiritual father to the Corinthian church, he's initiating a clear plan to help his sons and daughters. And this letter that we're reading now is part of that care plan. Here's Paul's three-point plan for discipling the church. The first part of the plan, we, we've just looked at it, verse 16, imitate me. Remember his words in last week's message from the first part of this chapter. Paul says he's been weak, he's been dishonoured, he's been unfed, homeless and poorly treated. And he's challenging them to be as humble as he is and imitate him in all of that, as well as in all the good stuff as well. And if I'm honest, I can find that a really big challenge. How confident am I to say to people, imitate me? I can think of some people in my close circle, in my life group, and I think of how, if they knew what I, I was really like sometimes, if they saw me as perhaps some of the most closest people in my life saw me, I might not want them imitating that. So I think this is a strong call to personal holiness, to discipling yourself, first and foremost. Something which Paul will unpack more strongly in the, in the upcoming chapters. The second part of the plan that Paul puts in place is to recognise that discipleship is best done in person. And since he can't be there physically at the moment, he sends Timothy to the church to help work with them and help, help them work out some of the issues that they're facing. And in doing so, he's addressing two main discipleship areas. The first is that he's personally refusing to get sucked in to the factionalism which seems to be gripping this church. Paul knows that if he, if he appears now in person, then people are going to start taking sides again. They're going to say, oh no, I'm aligned with Paul now because he's here. It's a bit like the person in your church who demands to speak to the pastor, the main guy, the big cheese, because they think that somehow the head person is going to sort out their problem in a way that no one else is able to do. And Paul is countering that by saying, no, receive the leaders you have in front of you. Receive those who's God, who God has put in front of you. See, the other thing he's doing here is leadership development. By sending his young disciple, remember, this is the same Timothy who Paul would write directly to and remind not to let anyone look down on you because you're young. Which means that the Corinthian church would have had to show a great deal degree of humility in receiving this young man in Paul's place instead. But he comes, Timothy, with Paul's full confidence in his ability to do the job that Paul is sending him to do. And in the same way Jesus disciples us, Paul has filled and equipped Timothy, sent him out, and communicated his full confidence in this young man. And he wants the church in Corinth to receive the leader that he is sending, even though it's not him, which they might have been a bit disappointed about. And then the final part, of course, of his plan is to promise to return himself. Paul says in verses 18 to 19, some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing. And then 
I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. Actually, what we realize here is that Paul's three-point plan is really a four-point plan. Because he goes on to say in verse 20, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What Paul is saying here is not that he's going to roll into town full of signs and wonders, all spirits blazing, but that he wants to communicate once again to the church their complete and utter dependence on the Holy Spirit, both for salvation and for sanctification. It's not a work of Paul that's being done in the church. It's a work of grace through the Holy Spirit. See, Paul doesn't want a showdown with the people. He wants them to come, he wants to come gently and in love to them, which is why he's pleading with them now to change their ways before it's too late. And you know what? I think similarly, my dad didn't want to have to come home and discipline me. I'm sure that after a hard day of work, he would have much rather wanted to come home in love and with a gentle spirit. But because he took his roles as a dad seriously, that meant that sometimes he had to deal out discipline as any good father should. Paul doesn't want to have to do that to the Corinthians, so he's warning them now to change their behaviour. Paul is a good father to his spiritual children. But at the same time that I read these words, I'm reminded of Jesus' words in Matthew 23. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers and sisters. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he's in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, because you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. And you think to yourself, hang on, is Paul contradicting Jesus, Jesus himself, with these verses, when he says to imitate him because you don't have many fathers? I don't think so. Actually, I, I think what Jesus is saying here is the perfect and final counter-argument to addressing the factionalism that Paul has been trying to battle against. Because he's right, isn't he? See, we all have one earthly father. You all have a dad. Depending on your journey to faith in Jesus, you might have one or more leaders or spiritual fathers, as you might consider them, who preach the gospel to you, who discipled you along the way, and who help build up your faith in your walk with God to make you more spiritually mature. And those leaders are to be honoured, yes, and even to be imitated. But you only have one Heavenly Father, and you don't need any more. And your Heavenly Father, in his great love for us all, sent Jesus. See, therefore, as leaders, influencers, disciples, of, of church of people want trying to one another each other. Our fatherhood and teaching is only useful if it points the way to Jesus. See, leaders come and go, but our Heavenly Father will always remain. So let's allow ourselves, yes, to influence and be influenced the, those around us. Let's influence them in return as well, through serving and discipling and pursuing holiness with one another. Yes, let's honour and imitate godly leaders as long as they help point the way in the kingdom of God to the Father of all fathers. And let's try and be a church where we build one another up and invite people in. Would you like to be like that? Let me pray and then we can respond to God together. Lord, I thank you so much for this community. I thank you for the people who are joining this community, who are discipling one another. Thank you, Lord, for leadership and accountability and good structures within the church that make it work well. But I thank you, Lord, most of all for Jesus, who gave us the model for what fatherhood is like, who gave us the model for discipleship and who we want to imitate more than anything. Father, fill the church with your Holy Spirit. Help us to disciple one another and help us to pursue you with a new and greater holiness and community together. In Jesus' name. Amen.